and welcome to another episode of the Fantasy Writers Toolshed. I'm your host, Richie Billing, and today I'm delighted to be joined by award-winning journalist and Afro-futurist author Denise Crittenden, who's joining me to talk about her brand new book, Where It Rains in Colour, which is being published by the brilliant Angry Robot Books. And I'm also excited to share that I will be partnering up with Angry Robot Books over the coming weeks and months to bring you exclusive interviews with some of their very talented authors. So if you know of any writers that have been published through Angry Robot, write in at the fantasy writers toolshed at gmail.com with your requests and I'll see what I can do for you. Before we get into the fascinating discussion with Denise, just a quick reminder that if you haven't already done so, to follow or subscribe. This way you don't miss any episodes, which can sometimes slip through the net. So to make sure you don't miss any, just hit that follow button. If you like what we do and you want us to do even more, please share a quick rating on the Spotify mobile app or a quick review on iTunes. And to help us even more, share on social media or sharing it with anyone you know who you think may be interested is a massive help. So thank you very much if you do that. If you want to keep on learning about fantasy writing beyond this podcast, then do check out our Patreon page. We have all different tiers, which uh, cater towards writers at different stages of their journeys. You can access writing classes, books, interviews, and exclusive guides. And don't forget, you can also join our online writing group. We congregate on Discord and Facebook, and there's about 300 people in each one now. So they're both bustling places and perfect locations to find fellow like-minded writers who you can share your writing with and get feedback on. And that's a, a fantastic way to improve. The links for everything I mentioned there are in the description. And now it's time to introduce the brilliant Denise Crittenden for a chat about her brand new book and the writing process. I'm delighted to be joined today by award-winning journalist, author and teen motivational speaker, Denise Crittenden. Denise, welcome to the Soul Shed. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Oh, it's wonderful to have you. How are you doing? Are you having a good day? Yeah, my day is just getting off to a great start because this is the day before my book launch. So Ooh. I'm in really a great space, yes. Very exciting. Congratulations as well. Thank you. And the new book is called Where It Rains in Colour. And it's coming to the shelves courtesy of Angry Robot. So it's a, it's a big deal. And I, from what I've read of it, I haven't been able to get a copy. Um, obviously, got one ready to go for when it comes out but uh, what I have read and heard it looks and sounds amazing I think that'll be a a good place to start you I mean I should say for listeners because you're going to be hearing this when the book is already out and I've got a link in the description to go and check it out so please do you can you can start reading right away and I'm sure you're going to love it and I think it's a really good place to start so Denise why don't you tell us all about it well, where it rains in color, first of all, is set on a fictitious planet called Swazembe. And Swazembe is, was colonized by the descendants of the Dagon tribe in Africa. Here's the interesting thing. The Dagon are real. They're yeah. very mystical, and I'll tell you more about them later. I had the idea that the Dagon, because of their um, mythology, that what if what they're saying really happened. The Dagon charted a star called Sirius B that was not known in the Western world. And yeah. no one believed them. It turned out later, I think after the invention of the Hubble telescope, and uh, the star was found by astronomers in first world societies, that the star does exist. Astronomers yeah. went back to Dagon and said, how on earth did you know this? They live in huts on the side of a cliff. They live in a village. They yeah. said that be- they said that beings from space came down on a spinning arc and told them all about the cosmos. And mm. no one believes them, so they call it their mythology. Yeah. But my my question, Richie, is this. If it's not true that this happened, how did they know about it? How do they exactly. know more about cosmos than Western astronomers, and they have no it's technology. Amazing, isn't it? It's amazing. Yeah. I, I love all these unexplained mysteries. This is my my kind of thing. So, and this provided the foundation for your book. You just 
just ask that simple question, which so many authors come on the show and just say, this is how I finally came up with this idea. I just asked, what if? Right. That's the that's the ultimate speculative fiction question, what if? Now, here's the other interesting thing. When I sat down to write it, I didn't have the Dagon in mind. They didn't come to the forefront of my mind until the second draft. The first draft, I was basing it on a dream I had. I had a dream of this woman wearing this dark robe, standing on a cliff, and she was being taunted by these translucent beings. Yeah. And the dream was so intriguing and there were other aspects of the dream too so i woke up and jotted it down but i couldn't do anything with it i had to go to work i was working at that time as a newspaper reporter so i just took my notes and stuck them in a drawer and forgot all about it until um years later when i suddenly had the time i was in between jobs and i says what about that amazing dream that i had in the meantime over the course of years i had been exposed to workshops on melanin and i oh. also had watch a star trek episode that involved a visit to an all-black planet and i was excited about it it was good but i kept i said to myself well they didn't explore this they didn't explore that you know i guess that's up to to me as a woman of um, african descent to do that because i'm going to bring i would bring some different nuances to something like that yeah so i decided that i wanted to create the most fantastic black planet i could imagine Nice. And I have this idea, Richie, that there's all this talk about skin color, right? And racism based on skin color, even though it's actually more political, but they yeah. say it's based on skin color. And I says, you know what? They don't like color. I'm going to give them color. <laughs> so I made, I made this planet just so rich in color. So this planet called Sostoisenbi is has floating um, vapors of color on the surface. These colors yeah. are electromagnetic, so the the inhabitants live underground in this spectacular, glitzy city. Dark skin is revered throughout the galaxy, yeah. and there's a beautiful, uh, very dark, midnight black woman by the name of Lalila, who is about to be named the rare indigo, which would make her the most beautiful woman in the galaxy, and a representative and host for the planet yeah but then you know something goes awry she develops some kind of scarring on her skin she doesn't know what's going on and everyone's you know alarmed and her life changes at that point and also the reality on swazembi which up until this point has just never known problem really any serious problems in fact they're a tourist resort Ah, it's a, it sounds like a fantastic setup, and this character, yes, Lalila, fantastic sound and uh, twist with the the skin condition, and obviously that's gonna make a, a massive impact on her as a character. So, is that where you? Obviously, I think the world is where you began. It sounds absolutely incredible. I love the sound of it. It's it's truly unique. It's, it's not not anything I've come across before, and it's something I, I really am excited to read. Once you created that world. Was it then the characters that you wanted to explore? Well, this is my first novel. So I, yeah. I, don't, I don't think, to be honest, I knew where to begin. Yeah. And as as I wrote, the novel took shape. You know, I think that um, I had to go back and rewrite the first part of the novel. Someone else asked me that question, which is easier, the endings or the beginnings? And I said, maybe the... Um, ending and the central part and the core of the novel are easier because by then you're really in that zone yeah. when i started i had this dream and it might sound like oh she had it easy she had a dream that gave her anything the dream just really <laughs> gives you the idea and then it's up to you to get in there and flush it all out and figure yeah. and figure out what it means so i started you know with uh Lalila being enchanted with the colors, wanting to go to the surface, but she's always in training. She's training all the time and she's frustrated. And I must say this, that, you know, she's kind of a spoiled brat. She's been pampered all of her life because she's, you know, was handpicked and prepared for this role. Just like yeah. we see one in this country or any other country, someone who has always had a charmed life. They're not always the, how can I put it? They're just not always the, you know, the most caring well she's caring but there's not they're not always focused on others they're yeah, focused just on take things for granted i suppose and yes know, yes privileged, but, privileged but, 
But I set her up that way because she undergoes a major metamorphosis after she um, contracts this condition. Yeah, because that is a massive fall from grace, isn't it? I can imagine. Yes, yes. So there are these other beings on another planet that's dying. That planet is called Clavin. So I must qualify this and say where it rains in color is a utopia, dystopia kind yeah. of experience. Because once we start dealing with Clavin, it's not so beautiful and, you know, perfect. And so they claim to have a cure because yeah. Lalila is the only one infected with this um, problem. And by the way, the problem, the, 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 her skin condition is known as keloid. And yeah. that came from the, the dream because the translucent beings were talking about keloids. So that's where that came from. But anyway, so others uh, in the galaxy have it as well. Not a lot, but some people. But it seems to only affect um, people of color. Yeah. You must have some color to develop this. The, the, these beings on Clavin who are kind of wretched beings, they claim they have a cure. They prove that they have a cure. And so Lalila must go off to an asteroid where it's the only place where she can find this solution. And that's yeah. where she begins to hear these voices. She's already starting to hear them a little bit, but they yeah. start to become more enhanced. These voices in her head that's, that have been troubling her, and she hasn't shared that, this with anyone. So she, the, the voices become stronger, and then the voices uh, evolve into visions. And yeah. then she discovers that she's a telepath and a clairvoyant, and she can literally travel back through time but not physically spiritually yeah. her mind and her energy go back through time and and she enters the souls of her ancestors that's really interesting yeah. so it sounds like it's a nice mix of science fiction and fantasy is that fair to say yes i, I consider it a sci-fi fantasy hybrid yeah and again i don't see many of them so yeah. it's nice to see you really Put two fingers up to the rules and you just thought i'm going to do it my way and it sounds absolutely excellent yeah that's one way of putting it i i did it <laughs> my way. yeah i i had had these ideas and they it turned into sort of a, a fusion of um yeah. of different worlds and different realities and the 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 dogon the tribe that i mentioned they come into the picture later when Lalila arrives on the asteroid and she's communicating with the ancestors because, of course, they are her, her ancestors. But also African-Americans are her ancestors because we're looking at a planet that's, you know, thousands of years in the future. So there's a lot there for her to explore as she starts to traverse time. Before leaving uh, her planet, her home world of Swazembi, and going to the asteroid, yeah, she's heard a little bit about her ancestors, but doesn't know that much about them. So what I'm trying to say is that on Swazembi, the inhabitants don't even know that they're descendants of the Dagon tribe. That's something that Lalila really discovers, and she teaches the rest of the galaxy about the Dagon after she has that experience of interacting with them yeah. um, and learning as much as she can while she's on the um, asteroid learning and growing and becoming a healer because when she goes back through time in her spirit she starts to heal those that she encounters by by being a presence in their mind and sending them the, the right energy and getting them to believe in who they are and just doing whatever she needs to to uplift because the belief is that there is no past present and future that yeah. everything is is now and she, she believes and she proves that you can heal the past. Like, yeah. for instance, Richie, right now, if someone from your past, a grandparent that you knew of, suffered at one point, you can send energy to the past to help them in the healing process now to them. I believe that. That's cool. Yeah. It, is, it is fascinating. I, got, I love the sound of it and it's really unique it sounds like you you you've you haven't been short of ideas anyway and i always wonder because this is something i struggle with when i'm writing is when you've got all these ideas how do you know which ones are the ones to develop did you ever encounter anything like that when you were writing the book probably 
probably not. Um, maybe I developed them all. <laughs> um, <laughs> nice. Maybe, maybe, maybe I didn't. I think that when you sit down and write, you pretty much have one idea, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe you have a couple. And then the other di- ideas come up. Like, for instance, the Dagon weren't part of the idea of the first plan. Yeah. The idea of her traveling energetically to the past, like in her spirit, I'm not sure that was part of the idea. I think the idea was just that she's beautiful, not despite her blackness, which is what we get now, you know, on this planet in our society. She's beautiful because of her blackness. So I was... I was flipping beauty standards and that was the idea. And so the idea too was that she was going to develop this condition. And as a result, she was going to come into her power. So I think that was the core idea and everything else. The, those were just layers that were added through the process of writing. Nice. Yeah. And are you a bit of a planner then? Do you like to have it all mapped out or do you sometimes just like to see where it goes? I have to see where it goes. And I, I've i heard writers say that they write outlines and that like terrifies me because <laughs> I, I don't think I would be able to function with an outline. Even when I was like in high school, you know how the English teacher would say, okay, do an outline and they would expect you to submit your paper with the outline. I would write my paper and then I would think, oh my gosh, that's right. She wanted an outline. So then I would do the outline to put with it. <laughs> I just, I have never functioned that way. And in fact, excuse me, as I was preparing to write the novel, I kind of started writing short stories yeah. and I was submitting them to contests. But I found it so interesting that the only one of my short stories that placed yeah. didn't win, but it placed was the one that I sat down at my laptop. Not only did I not have a a plan, I didn't even have an idea. I just sat there and started writing. And (laughs) that's the one that turned out to be the best because I think that seems to be the way my mind works. Yeah. I I can't plan it. How about you? Do you plan? I used to plan an awful lot. but. Hmm. I found that I was having to change a lot of it because as you write, the characters become more alive, don't they? And they make their own decisions. And yes, I think yeah. one of the best examples, I'm working on a, an edit for a novel now. And originally there's two protagonists, a man and a woman, and they were going to have a bit of a romantic thing. But as I'm editing it now, I'm looking at the interactions that have happened between them. And I'm just thinking, there's no way that this woman anyway would not like this man. <laughs> he's not, he just keeps messing everything up and she's quite a impatient and short person. So like she, she definitely is just not tolerating him at the moment at this point <laughs> in the story. And it's only when you've, you've done that first draft, you've kind of told yourself the story and you're going back and you're editing that you sort of take a step back and, and think about the characters and how they're reacting emotionally with different things that are happening in the story and with other characters. And I don't know, have you ever experienced anything like that? Yeah, well, this is my first novel, but I do find that the characters take over at a certain point. Yeah. I, I don't think um, they're taking over in the early stages, but midway the novel, they did things that, I didn't expect. And I remember when I was doing the first draft, even I was telling a friend about it. And um, her daughter, who was in middle school at the time, was there listening. And she said, Denise, it sounds like you're reading a novel instead of writing a novel. And she said that because I was acting surprised and sharing my surprise about what was happening. And in my second draft, I had a character who the readers, you know, those who read the book will recognize later after, since I'm bringing this up, she actually dies in my, in that draft and the first draft and the second oh, yeah. draft, she doesn't, she doesn't die because my agent said, you bring her back. <laughs> you bring her back. <laughs> she, my agent liked the character, my original agent. So yeah. 
when I brought her back, Richie, and I don't know if you've had this experience, she was angry at me. I'm not making this up. I could feel it. <laughs> I could feel attention. I could yeah. feel like I could feel like she didn't want to like deal with me, but she couldn't go too far because like to her, I'm God. I could kill her again. Yeah. But I could tell but she came back with this vengeance and this get out of my way. And at that point, I tell you, she took over. Yeah. It's, it's hard to explain. I know I, I do relate. I can relate to it. I, when I finished my first novel, and I'd sent it all off and it was coming out. I didn't have any more to do on it. And I, someone asked me, how do I feel? You must be, you must be delighted. And I turned around and I said, I'm actually really sad and quite down. And it's because these characters live in your head for years. And it's uh -huh. like having people there or with you all the time. So I understand completely how this character's come back into your mind and that they've obviously felt so alive now that they are mm. reacting in a sort of real way. So, yeah, it, right. it must have made for uh, interest in writing when you yeah. brought them back into and, it. Well, when I brought her back, because what happens, she attempts suicide and she succeeds the first version, the second version, she doesn't succeed. So she's yeah. back. And um, I didn't like her. But the second time around, even though she's a kind of an obnoxious person, she's a villain. She's my antagonist. Yeah. I came to respect her because I saw some qualities, even though she wasn't the nicest or isn't the nicest person in the world. There are some things that she says that makes that make me think. <laughs> it's just weird, you know. Yeah. And um, how did you find writing? Did you did you have any um, like point of view chapters from the antagonist? Um, yes. Yeah. Um, the um, and some readers will like this, and some readers won't. But the first part of the book, the book is divided into three sections. The first section is solely through um, the POV of my protagonist, Lalila. Yeah. The second section is from the part part of it, not all of it. The first half of the second section is from the POV of the of the Clabs, those who live on Clabin, the dying planet. Yeah. So uh, this antagonist has a POV there. Um, then by the third section, I would say it's mainly from the POV of Lilila again. Yeah. So it, it kind of goes back and forth like that. No, it's good to have the, diff the different perspectives. Especially, I, I like to, to mix perspectives between chapters. Yeah. Uh, There's a good sort of way to create suspense if you can leave one on a cliffhanger and then you just go to something completely different and make them wait. That's how basically I got through Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, sometimes you can't stay in the same POV because you have too many other characters and things happening and, and chapters yeah. that must be, must be from their perspective. How many point of view characters did you have in this i think i have four yeah so it, yeah. it, it i always find the more you have the, the longer the book my my, my book is 410 pages that's because nice. the um it's it's kind of a slow burn the build up in the beginning getting yeah. to know the Lila and exploring the world of uh swazembi and you know because because i the, the world is is a fun place and yeah. I wanted to spend time there in, in her utopia. And um, I wanted readers to really get a feel for her before she um, ran into her her trauma. Yeah, it's really nice to have the ability to explore a universe, though, because many people looking at these genres, that's what they want, isn't it? It's the escapism. Well, that's what I think. Uh, some people um, like escaping into um, escaping into a bleak world. Yeah, and I th I think a bleak world, you know, is something to explore and read because come on now, it's not looking very optimistic right now in terms of our future. And also, we like looking at different outcomes, and we don't know what's going to you know happen with this you know, third rock from the sun we call the planet Earth. We have no idea yeah. what's going to happen. So, wow. you know, I, I get that. But I like escaping into beauty. Yeah. 
I think that's I, a that's a really interesting angle to take, yeah. Because yeah, most think... people, I, I was talking to someone about this the other day, and a lot of fantasy is just I, I this is the kind of fantasy I love, and this is what I write, but it's it's riddled with conflict. So it yeah. could be like wars, battles, sword fights, whatever, I, right, or it's... even just like political, you know, like bickering amongst each other, mind games, stuff like that. But in our lives, like, I mean, I'm one of these people who, who always tries to avoid conflict. I just want a nice, quiet, happy life. I just want to go about my own business, just leave me alone, kind of thing. When right. it comes to I'm... fiction, we crave conflict. And if we don't have it, we're bored. Yeah, I I think that that's what they that's kind of a, um, a foundation for life. I think that they say if someone has a perfect life, they're not going to be happy. There was a, a whole movie based on that. I can't remember the name of it, but um, the characters had they lived in such an idyllic world. They had to create um, they created a drug so that they would go back to go to this world and deal with problems and agony and then they take another drug and then they could return to their current reality and appreciate the joy more. I guess there's a belief that you can't appreciate um a beautiful life or everything being going well unless you've had things go wrong. So maybe that's why people are drawn to the conflict. I personally, you know, maybe I've been unfortunate or fortunate, depending on how you look at it. I've had enough drama in my life that I don't have to seek any out. Yeah. Yeah, I totally get that. But there's yeah. there's going to be conflict though. There's going to be conflict. But I just think escapism should be an escape to something better than what you know. And so that's yeah. what I try to create, especially with this dealing with people of African descent, because yeah. I wanted to create a world where um black people were the leaders. Black people weren't dealing with racism and discrimination, where black people were admired and and our our um our gifts and our talents were um thoroughly released and expressed i wanted something like that but yeah. like i said there's going to be conflict because there's conflict in life yeah, so. yeah definitely yeah like the opposing force isn't it <laughs> well I, I was going to ask you about go back to to the layla and what your process was like when you created her well the process was just describing someone who met the standard of the person in the dream, but I actually couldn't see her that well. So I was the one who decided that she would be breathtakingly beautiful. And so from that point of view, if I wanted to make her dark and beautiful, I just decided as I was writing, I don't think I decided this before I started writing, make her um, brilliant black and I lived in uh, Zimbabwe for about a year. And so I'm African American and I'm like in between brown. Yeah. When I was in Zimbabwe, I met some people who were literally black as the night. And I discovered that when I encountered someone, because they, because they're a range of, uh, skin tones too. They're not all one complexion, like no like no one is. Yeah. But when I would see someone that dark and Richie, they happen to be beautiful too. Yeah. There's something about that combination. And I'm getting chills now just talking about that combination of being beautiful and then being like blue black on yeah. top of being beautiful, that fusion or whatever is breathtaking. Yeah. You would like you lit I literally when I saw someone like that, I would turn and stop and stare. Yeah. You know, someone once explained to me why that is. And they said that designers like it too. Like when they find fashion models, there's this one fashion model. I think they call her the queen of dark. Her thing is, I think her name is Nayakim. She's from the Sudan. Yeah. The fashion designers like them because there's something about the, the light, that the way light reflects on them and the, the way the, uh, the way colors are so much more vibrant, I don't know. I know that it's something to behold. And so yeah. while I was reading her, I was remembering that experience of meeting women who are darker than the average woman you would see, even black women in the U.S., and just striking. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I wanted to go to that. And I said, well, what is, I don't know what that is that makes them stand out like that. And I said, well, there's a shimmer. So I made my character shimmer. Yeah. And then I decided to make the shimmer part of her power. I mean, not the power that she develops later, because later she discovers this in, inner strength and this telepathy and this clairvoyance. No, this was just her the power of, of her beauty. Yeah. And she later discovers, not at that point in the novel, that, you know, they're kind of abusing that because they're using this ability to shimmer to um, charm people. When mm-hmm. it could be used, for, it could be used for a greater good, but that's something that comes later. So as I sat down to write, all these things were going through my mind as I was creating this character. I hope I didn't overdo it in terms of making her spoiled. I did that though because I wanted to show the contrast because yeah. she she changes. It's, her change is so remarkable, and this is the person she always was. But if you're a prisoner of your own beauty and you've been pampered all of your life, how would you yeah. even know? That you are that you have this this tendency to give and be compassionate. You may not know it's there. Yeah, I think I think some people don't they when when they're very young, like they'll, they'll have that care in nature. I think children are very innocent, aren't they? And you, you can see what the, the nature is. And so obviously, mm-hmm. as they, they grow older and they fall into different peer groups and all the pressures from society, they change. And like you say, it, it, it's always there. And it's yeah. it's a really interesting. It's like I kind of get the yeah. feeling it's like it's almost a bit like the the, the illnesses that that she gets. Like it's it's like a cocoon, and mm-hmm. she has to go on a, a journey to to free herself of it. And in the end, like becomes this this beautiful butterfly. Exactly, you know. And now I'm remembering. Um, during my years as a newspaper reporter, I was once sent to the Miss America pageant. Yeah. Um. The editor who sent me wanted me to do something different. There were actually reporters there covering the pageant. That wasn't my job. I didn't file stories every day. The editor, uh, the features editor who sent me said, I just want you, she said, I want you to stay there for a week and get some behind the scenes stuff and interview these ladies and come back and write a story on what it's really like what their personalities are like and, and what's really going on behind the scenes. And it was really interesting because all kinds of things were going on behind the scenes. But yeah. I brought that up now in answer to your question because I remember there was a, a one contestant, Miss Mississippi, very beautiful woman. And she was so beautiful. It's okay to say this because no one knows what year I'm talking about, so I'm not pinpointing <laughs> anyone. But it was, she was so beautiful. It was almost like she didn't have a brain. And the other, all the reporters, after we interviewed her, we would get together and compare notes and we would laugh about the things she would say. And at one point I said to them, you know what? It's like she's a prisoner of her own beauty. Yeah. And that's what it was. And so that's what Lalila is in the beginning. She's a prisoner of her beauty. Yeah, that's really nice. nice. And it sounds like you, you've drawn on your experiences working as a journalist and a reporter. Is that, is that something that's helped you? Yes, but I didn't know it. You know, it's it's interesting. Yeah. Later when I read the manuscript, I'd say to myself, oh, that's based on that experience. Oh, my God, I think that that was inspired by the time this or that might have been from this. You don't I don't I think it's subconscious. Yeah, it could but be I think like you know, something that you, you've developed, like without realizing over the years, because I, I, how, how long were you, Janice? It was about 30 years. Yeah, 30, 40 years. Long. It feels oh. like all my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you must have seen a lot in your time. Yeah. And then one one um interviewer asked me the question, Well share me the share with me the um story that's one of the most amazing stories you ever wrote or whatever. I was like, Oh my god, please don't ask that. Because I don't <laughs> it was too long ago and it was too many years and all that. But yeah. yes, I think that all of our experiences, our personal experiences from childhood. Um, our life experiences, people we know, when we sit down to write fantasy, I think it's incorporated, but it's in a disguised way. And it's disguised even to you because you don't know you're doing it, but it's coming through from you, it's coming through you. So it's going to be filtered by what you've observed and what you've experienced. And then afterwards, you kind of, you kind of sort of notice it. Yeah, I definitely relate to that. I always notice the same themes or little features dropping up in in my stories and I I when I realise I always have a laugh to, laugh at, laugh to myself because I under I understand completely where they came from. I haven't 
consciously put them in. They're just coming in because it, like you say, it's who you are and right. how you're basically made up. So yeah, it's, it is really interesting. Something yeah. I wanted to ask you about in particular was your world building because it sounds like an incredible universe that you've created. It's not even just one world, but a, a broad universe. So how, how did you approach that process? Did you, were you quite organized or did you just sort of explore as you, you went through the story? I explored as I went through the story. Um, I'm not organized. You know, I don't think maybe, maybe I'm not a linear thinker. That's probably part of it. And I remember writing one chapter. This was my first version. In the middle of the night, I woke up, went to my laptop, and one of my characters was on the surface doing something I didn't understand. And I was like, okay, what's going on? What's going on? I didn't even get to that chapter until later in the book. So as you can see, my process is a little haphazard. It's a good one to, to, to have, though. I try and strike a balance now between being loosely organized and letting the, letting the story unfold. And what I think that helps with is keeping your readers interested because they can't work out what's coming because you don't even know what's coming. So it's less yeah. predictable, less formulaic, and yeah. it can keep people hooked. Yeah. And, yeah. and and that's just and that's just who I am. You know, I read somewhere once a writer said, Well, how am I supposed to know what's on my mind until I sit down and start writing it? And I was thinking, yes, that's me, because we don't really know what's there. And again, if I start planning it, then I feel like I'm in the way. Yeah. And I'm I'm a spiritual person and I feel like there's, you know, a power greater than me moving through me yeah in this case if, in this case it could be the inspiration from the dagon ancestors themselves who knows i just made that up i don't i i could i don't know and i'm not saying it matters one way or the other but i'm just saying that if you plan too much you're acting as if you have all the power yeah but after all it is a creative process and I think if you plan, you, mm -hmm. you, you, you create the scaffolding in your mind and you can't deviate from it. Right. And you have to live up to it. Yeah. And you put pressure on yourself and you're not. Um, and like I said, you're, you're in your way. You're giving yourself more credit than maybe you deserve because I think it's real interesting that the only short story I've ever written that placed and came close to winning this major contest was the one that I sat down with nothing in my head and I had no, no idea. But the ones that I had the idea, then I had to live up to the idea and I had to try to figure it out myself. You know, the, they didn't come out quite as well. Yeah. But, but again, that's just me. I'm the same way with everything. I'm a, I'm a really good dancer. And I had to go to a dance class once. Yeah. I don't really dance class. Not that dance classes aren't good, but it was something I won. And I mean, that's when I discovered the instructor was showing us what to do. And for the first time in my life, I froze and I didn't know what to do. And I was confused. And then I pulled back and I didn't follow the instructions. I watched and I realized, oh, that's not the way my brain works. Mm. I You can't. I just have to observe it yeah. and feel it. I feel it. So it comes from being a, a person who's just in your feelings, who's kinesthetic. I have to feel something before I can experience it and do it. Yeah. I'm not a nuts and bolts person. No, I, I get that completely. Okay, right. Yeah, okay. I think I'm quite similar in, in some respects. Yeah. Like yeah. if, yeah, you've got to be really into it, like <laughs> to, to invest yourself and learn. And I think that's why I enjoy writing so much because I don't know, it's like when I started doing it, I don't know if you've ever experienced this. It's like when in them early days when like you just sort of drunk on creativity um, and you're just writing all the time. Like yeah. it's, it's like pure bliss. I'm sort of hooked on that drug now and that feel of just creating things. And I just try and encourage other people not to lose that feeling in the beginning because very soon, I don't know if you've ever experienced this with your writing, like you've got to a point where you've, you're reading over what you've written and you realise you're not very good. So you go <laughs> off and you try and learn. So, I mean, have you got any 
tips on how you've improved your writing over the years? I mean, you've obviously worked as a journalist, so you're writing every day. And that for me is one of the, the best bits of advice you can you can give someone is just write every day, get into a habit. But what what tips have you got? Have you got any guidance to share? Well well, this is my first novel. And what I learned and I don't know, maybe some of the more experienced fantasy writers don't need to hear this, but for me, I had to learn to slow down because as a journalist, we're speed writers. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't get into that zone and we are not thoughtful, but you're writing on deadline. Yeah. And I had that mentality and I had to have um, the agent and the publisher when they saw it tell me to slow down and so that that was a big learning curve for me there are lots of learning curves i had to learn how to um you know instead of doing info dumping sprinkle um back the backstory and through yeah. the book um i had i think the learning how to develop characters who exist only in your head how to yeah. flesh out the characters uh, learning how to make the dialogue sound natural. It all was a learning curve for me, Richie. Seriously, I just, but I had to learn as I went along. I went to a couple of workshops and, you know, you know, read some stuff online, that kind of thing. But I think you're, you're kind of self-taught. I, yeah. I had planned to um, go to one of those one of those workshops that you're there for a week or two weeks. But, oh, but yeah. before I was able to get accepted to one like that, I ended up selling my novel. Yeah. So they 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 said to me, I don't need that. But I do need to learn and grow. And obviously the net, the second novel will be better than the first one because I've I've learned so much in the process of writing this one. I can't say that um I was bored. I'm still in that place of pure bliss because yeah. I was used to writing every day, but I was used to writing journalism. Yeah. But that was still writing every day. And I have to say that I was ready to break free because I've been doing that for so long. It was almost like I could do it in my sleep and it came so natural for me. And I was ready to go to go on to the next challenge and something that I wanted to do all of my life. And I was kind of tired of dealing with facts yeah. and news. You know, I wanted to create what's, what didn't exist. So it this is all... Like a, uh, a little bit like uh, what happens in the story with Lalea. You wanted to break free of journalism like, in, and she was looking to, to break free of this, to break free of this, this curse that she's, she's been placed under. And it's like, it's funny how you, you've, you've obviously felt like you wanted to do that and you've done it. And... That kind of story is has worked its way into you, your own writing as well. It's it's really cool. Yes, yes, that is a good way of looking at it. Amazing. So, good question to finish on. What advice would you give to anyone thinking about writing their first novel? My best advice is to beg, borrow, and steal time wherever you can, because yeah. I don't have a lot of time. I am. Um, had started when I left uh, the industry, when I left the last magazine I worked for, I was teaching and ghostwriting. And nice. in between, I had to squeeze in because I pulled out my notes because I pulled out the notes years ago and written a skeletal version. And I that was sitting in a drawer for actually years. And I pulled that out and I said, OK, I'm going to do this. It's, it's, this has been around for too long, but I still didn't have the time. So I just had to squeeze in here and it, and it actually works. I mean, I, I don't know if other people think that you have to sit down and have this long block of time. Yeah. But, and, and, and I think that's what I thought. I thought I had to have this time that that's all I did. Well, it didn't happen that way for me. I had to fit it in. So my yeah. best advice is just to fit it in whenever you can, even if it's the middle of the night. And it might not be the same time every day. It might be the middle of the night. It might mean, oh, I have a couple of hours here. Let me use that time. Be creative. Yeah, definitely. I think, as I know if you ever found this, when you've got limited time, you feel the pressure more. Because I've had days where I've, I've, like, I've got nothing to do today. I'm just going to write all day. And then it's like three o'clock in the afternoon. I haven't done anything yet. But that's okay. Yeah. 
because you yeah. did what you want to do. I, I looked around one day and I really am kind of a meticulous about my home. I like to keep it. I'd like for it to look a certain way. And I looked around. I was like, oh, my God, things are a mess. OK, let me keep writing. <laughs> Oh mm. yeah, it is. It is time is precious, and yeah, I, 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 in the end, I ended up teaching. Well, I, I used to hate tapping and typing on touchpad screens, so mm. I had to teach, like, really practice and teach myself how to to type on my phone, and then I just have a Google Docs file open, and it's just like live, so I can just log on to my computer and carry on from where I left off, or work on my phone when I'm out and about. I found I was getting loads more done because I had no excuse. It was there in my pocket or I was at home and it was on my computer. And then on your phone, on that teeny tiny screen. Oh my God. It's weird, you know, nice. like, I don't know why, but I feel like I get loads more done on my phone. I don't know if it's because the screen's smaller and the letters are quite big, so it looks bigger and I feel like I'm getting more done. I don't really know, but yeah, I, it's quite effective. I don't know. I don't think I could do that. My yeah. hats off to you. I'm I'm extremely impressed. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I started those, I insisted on everything being on pen and paper first, and mm. realised how long that took because then you get to go and type it all up. So if you can just type it all up first time round, it does save a lot of time. But when I'm writing certain things, I do still like to use pen and paper. There, there are some writers. I think my Angelo, Tony Morrison, a few others who say that they write in pen and paper. I think Wayne Dyer, you know, the spiritual author. Yeah. So, so I can't, maybe because I'm just so conditioned, again, ha having been a journalist, and you sit at that screen. So no, the pen and paper, I guess I could jot down ideas. You know how you wake up in the middle of the night with your yeah. dreams, me and those dreams again, or just wake up, you get inspired, and all you have, like J.K. Rowling, is some, like, a paper towel, or just whatever, all you have is something around you just so you don't lose the idea. So I can... <laughs> Got down some ideas or a little bit, but to actually do the writing now. Yeah. I remember I used to have a, a writing shed when I was living in my mum's and I used to sit outside and because it was quiet out there. And I used to do all my writing in this little shed. And I had, I had this idea for a map, but I, I, I think I ran out of paper. So I mm -hmm. ended up drawing it on the inside of the shed. <laughs> and uh, that was pretty cool. Oh my God! Wow. Once you got rid of you got rid of the shed in the end. Well, oh. but but not not before you got your writing from it. Before yeah, exactly. Yeah, make good use of it. it over on something else. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. These are good stories. <laughs> oh well, Denise, thank you so much for taking the time to chat, chat with me today. It's obviously a big day for you tomorrow. Congratulations again on the release of Where It Rains in Color. Where can we find out more about you and your writing? Yes, I, my my uh, official website is still in progress, but I do have a blog site that has a lot of background about me and the books as well. And that is denisecrittenden.blog. Awesome. I'll put a link in the description as well. Just looking at it as well. It's a really nice looking site. And like I say, you've got some great content on here as well. I'm going to have a, a good uh, read of this later. Thank you again, Denise. It's been lovely chatting with you. I hope it all goes well tomorrow with the launch. I've had so much fun talking to you, Richie, and I learned a few things too. Thank you for that too. Oh, thank you very much. And thank you everyone yeah. for listening. A big thank you, Denise, for giving up your time to chat with me about where it rains in colour and your writing process. I hope you learned something new at home and be sure to check out Denise's book. It's out now. You can get it at every major bookstore as well as the Angry Robot website. So do go and check it out. I say thank you very much for listening. And it's the last episode now before the festive period. So I wish you a very happy and peaceful time with lots of, of time off doing what you love doing and spending it with the people that matter most in your lives. We will be back on the 28th of December with a bit of a festive episode and the last one of the year. To be sure you don't miss it, hit that follow or subscribe button. And if you've liked what you've heard today, a quick rating on the Spotify mobile app or a review on iTunes means an awful lot. So thank you very much if you take the time to do that. Also, if you share this episode 
on social media or with anyone who you think may appreciate it. Again, that is a huge help. So thank you very much. If you want to carry on your writing beyond what you hear on this podcast, then check out our Patreon page. You can get writing classes, books, resources of all shapes and sizes. So do check it out and be sure to join our writing group. Thank you again for listening today. Have a wonderful festive period and keep on scribbling. Scribbling.